I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. It's never too late for a St. Patrick's Day celebration. We'll take you to a parade in Park Slope from this weekend. I enjoy watching the parade, see everybody be proud of who they are. We all should be proud of where we came from originally. Plus, U.S. warplanes strike Libya. We'll have an update on the struggles of Christians there. And it may be Women's History Month, but a local group discusses masculine spirituality. We need to redefine what we are as, uh, as men in our church. And we need to redefine what we are as men in our society. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. You know, last week we brought you the sights and sounds of St. Patrick's Day celebrations here in the Big Apple. There were concerts, parades, masses, and more music. And if you thought you'd seen it all when it came to celebrations of the Emerald Isle, think again. Residents of Brooklyn got all decked out in their favorite green clothing this past weekend to celebrate Ireland and its legendary patron saint. It was the 36th annual St. Patrick's Day Parade through the streets of Park Slope. And as you're about to see, whether or not you were Irish, there was no shortage of Irish pride among parade goers. For our ancestors who kept the faith of St. Patrick and our traditions alive in our homeland and in exile, we pray to the Lord. This morning I'm here at Holy Name Parish to, uh, to celebrate Mass for all those who are going to be involved in the annual St. Patrick's Day Parade that's held here in Park Slope. And it's really an opportunity for the Irish American community and the larger community to come together to give thanks for the presence and the gifts and the talents and the achievements that Irish Americans have given to us, to our diocese, and the heritage that comes to us in faith from Ireland. So it's a great day. St. Patrick was a missionary sent to what is now Ireland, to the Celtic peoples, to bring them the word of Christianity, and he did. And there's an old tradition about St. Patrick that he drove out all the snakes of Ireland. He drove out basically all evil that he may have found there, all the paganism from Ireland, because of his holiness. And he's the patron saint of Ireland. The parade kickoff is at 1 o'clock. However, we have a little uh, special ceremony beforehand. Uh, and at 12.30, we're going to have a little dedication to 9-11. Uh, it's the 10th anniversary. So we're going to have a moment of silence. Uh, and then we'll have all the groups that come out. Our grand marshal and aides will lead it off. And uh, then we'll have all the following groups that are involved right behind that. here today to celebrate the uh, St. Patrick who brought the faith to Ireland. St. Patrick's Day celebration is a celebration of faith, heritage and culture. We have uh, all kinds of bands. Some are Irish bands uh, with pipers and drums. We also have some high school bands, marching bands. Uh, Fort Hamilton High School is one. Uh, then we have various schools from the neighborhood, from the local parishes, IHM, Holy Name. And then we have some antique cars as well that come out, some old police squads. And then we just have a lot of parents, moms with their kids with strollers as well, joining some of these groups and marching in as well. So it's a very nice break. It gets all the people who live in the community together, and everybody knows each other. And it's really a lot of fun. This is more of a community. And in Manhattan, it's kind of like crowded and everything. Uh, I don't care for Manhattan. I stay here. I enjoy watching the parade, see everybody be proud of who they are. We all should be proud of where we came from originally. Ireland. We're a little bit Irish. The Irish who came here as immigrants brought their faith, brought their commitment, and literally, in many ways, built the American church. Without the Irish presence in our, in our church here in the United States, we would not be who we are. So whether you're Irish, Italian, German, wherever, collectively as a church, we owe a tremendous debt of thanks to the Irish who were here and for their fidelity to the Lord. 
See, we can have fun here in Brooklyn too, on and around St. Patrick's Day. And I love what the little girl there toward the end had to say. You know, I'm a little bit Irish. I guess we're all kind of a little bit Irish uh, on and around, as I said, St. Patrick's Day. We'll stay with us. There's much more currents coming up. Pope Benedict prays for Libya as coalition forces attack Gaddafi's military. That story, plus the rest of the day's headlines, next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up later, some practical advice for men, courtesy of St. Joseph. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, in his Sunday Angelus Prayer, Pope Benedict made an appeal for the people of Libya following bombing by Allied forces that got underway this past weekend. Rome Reports has details. Benedict XVI has not hid his concern about the plight in Libya. He called on political leaders on both sides to ensure the safety of the Libyan people and access to humanitarian aid. Prego per coloro che sono coinvolti nella drammatica situazione di quel paese e rivolgo un pressante appello a quanti hanno responsabilità politiche e militari perché abbiano a cuore anzitutto l'incolumità e la sicurezza dei cittadini e garantiscono l'accesso ai soccorsi umanitari. The Pope said that he is closely following the situation in Libya and that he prayed for peace in that country during his week of retreat. Alla popolazione desidero assicurare la mia commossa vicinanza, mentre chiedo a Dio che un orizzonte di pace e di concordia sorga al più presto sulla Libia e sull'intera regione nordafricana. According to figures from the Aid to the Church in Need, Christians in Libya represent only 2.7% of the population. The main religion is Sunni Islam. Well, bombing by the U.S. and its allies has so far hit Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's compound. Gaddafi's whereabouts are not known. Now, coming up in just a bit, Edward Clancy from Aid to the Church in Need will join me to talk about Libya and much more. Well, more than a year after the devastating earthquake in Haiti, Haitians headed to the polls Sunday in a second round of runoff elections to pick a new president. Reports say voting was mostly calm despite two shooting-related deaths to, uh, related to election violence. Haitians were choosing one of two candidates, former law professor and first lady Milande Maniga and singer Michelle Martelly. Officials say results will be released on April 16th. Now, the return of former President Jean Beltran d'Aristide has raised concerns about political turmoil. Aristide is a former Catholic priest and Haiti's first democratically elected president. He returned to Haiti last week after having lived in exile in South Africa for seven years. Well, turning now to Egypt, where residents of that country voted freely for the first time in 50 years. Egyptians lined up to cast their ballots on constitutional changes aimed at doing away with restrictions on political rights and civil liberties. The voting comes after more than two months of fierce fighting between Muslims and Christians following the New Year's Day bombing of a Coptic Catholic cathedral in Alexandria. Well, in Rome, the Vatican is welcoming a decision on crucifixes in the classroom from the European Court of Human Rights. The court overturned a previous decision in ruling that hanging crucifixes in Italian classrooms will not violate the rights of non-Catholics. The court had previously ruled in favor of a mother who had complained that the crucifixes were a violation of secular principles. Meanwhile, in Ireland, the church has pledged an additional $14 million to help victims of sexual abuse by priests and other Catholic officials. Irish bishops also released a pastoral letter outlining the initiatives they have taken to help support victims of abuse. The Irish church had already spent around $28 million on a confidential helpline and counseling referral service. Back here in the U.S., a popular Catholic apologist is answering accusations of sexual impropriety. Father John Carapi, whose uh, talks draw thousands of followers around the country, is accused by a former employer of sexual misconduct with her and other adult women. He's also accused of drug addiction. The Bishop of Corpus Christi, where Carapi's religious community is located, has placed the priest on administrative leave. Carapi, meanwhile, denying all, all of the uh, allegations. Well, a new Washington Post-ABC poll showing a slim majority of Americans now support same-sex marriage. 
53% of those surveyed say same-sex couples should be allowed to marry. It's the first time ever that the poll has shown a majority in favor of such unions. But critics are questioning the poll, which asks respondents if it should be, quote, legal or illegal for same-sex couples to marry. And the president of the National Organization for Marriage says the term illegal could be taken to mean that violators would be arrested, a penalty which uh, he says that most Americans would consider harsh. From Montana, a pro-life prayer group, the 40 Days for Life, is filing a complaint with the FBI after being attacked with a homemade bomb. The incident took place last Thursday during a vigil outside an abortion clinic. Witnesses say police did not take the situation seriously. Now they say officers who responded claimed they would not be able to get any fingerprints from the bomb's remains and called the sanitation department to dispose of the debris. The organization says it's appalled by the attack and by the police response. And closer to home, young Catholics came together in Manhattan over the weekend in another effort to help Japan. We sent our cameras to check it out. We're here tonight to uh, raise funds for the victims of the earthquake in Japan. It was kind of a rapid response from the Contemporary Roman Catholics and the Catholic Fellowship, which are both young adult social groups here from the Tri-State area, coming together tonight to show our support for uh, Catholic Relief Services who are over in Japan trying to help out the people right now. I'm giving because the people in Japan are very dear to my heart. Um, I still have lots of family and friends in Japan. And I really wanted to appreciate the people who come to this event tonight who are supporting these people in Japan. I have never given for a natural disaster before and um, it has been a challenge for me to make a connection with the people who were affected by natural disasters and now this is, I think this is a great opportunity for me to learn um, how you need to think about other people um, in other parts of the world. I'm thankful that I'm giving this opportunity to give. It's a collective effort, and I think people of all faiths should do their part, and I'm happy to be a part of a group that's doing theirs. You can't just say, because they're an advanced culture, I'm not going to give any money to them to help them out. When people need help, they need help. That's it. I think that uh, when uh, Jesus was here, the area that he was in wasn't Catholic, but his teachings and Christianity is a source of being compassionate and helping other people, uh, and I think that no matter what religion whether it's Buddhist or Muslim or Catholic or Jewish, uh, we, show our, we show our faith in, in Christ and our Christianity and our, our belief in God in uh, living a Christian life and helping others. And the group was able to raise almost $1,000 that will be sent to Catholic Relief Services. Stay tuned, there's much more Currents ahead. When we return, as U.S. and coalition forces launch airstrikes in Libya, we'll look at the situation for Christians there and throughout the Middle East. Welcome back. Iraq, Egypt, Pakistan. These are just a few of the countries making headlines lately because of the persecution of religious minorities there. And uh, they are all ranked among the worst in the world for persecution of Christians in a new report. Uh, the report from the group Aid to the Church in Need shows 75% of religious persecution in the world is against Christians. And the number of Christians facing persecution totals 100 million. It's also a frightening time for people of all faiths in Libya right now, where U.S. and coalition forces launched airstrikes over the weekend aimed at stopping Muammar Gaddafi from attacking his own people. Joining me now to talk more about all of this is Ed Clancy with Aid to the Church in Need. Ed, thanks for being here. We appreciate well, your time. Thank you for having me again. Well, first of all, let's start off, since it was the last thing I mentioned here, with Libya, the situation mm -hmm. there. Um, is it, uh, obviously, it's, it's a very difficult time for everyone involved, but for Christians in particular as well? Yeah, uh, the, the community there, although small, has been there for centuries. Um, and there are two groups of, uh, of believers. There's the Italian-based and then the... Um, the uh, Maltese, mm. and many of them are immigrants who have worked and now second, third, and gen third generations. Um, but they have uh, they have had a difficult time 
in general, and uh, right now it's getting more difficult. Right. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of the, the immigrants who had been working and working and living in Libya have then been trying to get out, and a lot of them were, were caught really at the, um, at the border with Egypt trying to yeah. get out because of just a, a backlog of people kind of just stuck there. Has that been something that we've been seeing? Yes, it has. Uh, I mean, the Italian government was faced with a, a big issue because there were a lot of, uh, a lot of Libyans of Italian descent who were now trying to sort of renaturalize into Italy. And so the embassy was overloaded and a, a couple of boats were, you know, packed with people trying to leave, you know, trying to take some sort of uh, boat in the, the Mediterranean to other places but and also along the borders, even into Tunisia, which sure. is going through some strife now too. Right, right. But it's, it's <laughs> better there than it is in, uh, in Libya. Yeah, it's like that, that that whole region. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, Tunisia and and then e Egypt and now I in Libya, it's just been a, a very difficult time. And of course, yeah. the Pope, uh, uh, you know, talking earlier today about uh, you know his prayers going with uh, the people of Libya and and mm -hmm. all of the military operations that are now taking place there. And of course, we'll do the same. Now, as for this report, it's called mm -hmm. "Persecuted and Forgotten." Mm -hmm. Um, it's uh, the, the 2011 report on religious persecution uh, that, that you guys have issued. What are some really of the hot spots? I mentioned a, a few of them earlier. Uh, Egypt I is one, which yes. of course borders uh, Libya. Mm -hmm. um, Iraq, also Pakistan, we've heard a lot about recently with some, some killings of, of people who were um, opposed to blasphemy laws in right. that country. Um, how does this uh, report work? How is it? Uh, how do the, these rankings, I guess, of the worst places where Christian persecution takes place, how does that work? Well, the, the book is, we, we publish this book um, every two years, mm -hmm. and essentially it's a collection of stories, as you mentioned, in some of the real hot spots. Mm -hmm. But also, m very important for us is to put within it stories that connect people to what's going on. Right. Because we could put out a phone book of statistics, you know, and sure. like the CIA website does or something like that, but this gives you more insight into things like uh, the profile of the bishop and the, the, the stories of some of those who have been imprisoned or tortured or even murdered or, well, killed, however yeah. you want to put it, by, by governments or by extremists. And as far as countries, um, it, it, it generally is, Northern Africa is a, a broad s s you know, sort of uh, area of, of problems. Sure. But then there are other places like Nigeria, India, I mean, India generally is, is very Western in a lot of its beliefs, but there has been an upsurge of Hindu fundamentalism against Christians. Mm -hmm. And in the Christian and Catholic South, there has been this sort of incursion of, uh, you know, get them out of here. They're not true uh, Indians, not true to the faith of our country. Sure. So and you talk about places as well. I mean, like mm -hmm. countries like China, we, we often mm -hmm. uh, mention in discussions like this. Um, and the reasons in each of these countries, in each of these places, is, is obviously, uh, it can vary. I mean, as, mm -hmm. you, as you mentioned, the differences there between India and, and, and other places. Um, in, in China, is there, there's, a, of course, this great sort of, I guess, sense of nationalism. And really, yeah. the, I guess, the, the regime there suppressing any sort of other information other than what it wants to put out itself. Right. Uh, well, China's a place that it's sort of an intriguing place in that, that there's been a, um, an existence of two churches, the Patriotic Church above ground and then the Underground Church. Yeah. And the Underground Church were those who were faithful to Rome, who remained in China despite communist oppression. The Patriotic Church was the government's um, uh, way of sort of co-opting faith. And what they did was they approved licenses for worship in certain dioceses mm -hmm. and they installed their bishops and priests. But one of the strange things about it was you could have no, no allegiance greater than allegiance to China. Right. That included God. You mm -hmm. could not say God was above China. Yeah. That China, the government, was first. And even it would even go as far as believing in a supreme being was anti-Chinese. It was sure. against the communist government. So oh. you, know, you would have to have a bishop, theoretically, that was an atheist, yeah. which is kind of... It's a little, it uh, doesn't make much sense. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense at all. Well, um, really quickly before we wrap up here, uh, the report is available. Yes, it is. For people to, yes. to pick up. How can they do that? Well, they can call the 1-800 number, which is 1-800-628-NEED, N-E-E-D. Um, and then also you can check our website, which is churchinneed.org. Um, and if you call or send us an email, we can send out a free copy of the book to you. Great. Awesome. Well, and get it online. Get the hard copy right there in your hand. Yes. Okay, great. Thank Ed you. Clancy with Aid to the Church in Need, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, and stay tuned because there's much more Currents coming up.
Coming up, masculinity and spirituality go hand in hand at a Theology on Tap in Queens. If you want to be a true man, you have to be a man of love, be a man of courage, be a man of prayer. Well, finally tonight, becoming a saint is already difficult enough, but being a saint during the month of March presents its own challenges, especially when your competition for people's attention is the ever-popular St. Patrick. Yes, truth be told, though, there are many saints celebrated during the month of March. You know, they, they might not get a parade, but they definitely deserve our attention. We'll take, for example, a man from Nazareth who was a carpenter and played a significant role in ushering God into the world. No, it's probably not the man you're thinking about, but his foster father, St. Joseph, the husband of the Virgin Mary. On Saturday, the church celebrated the feast of St. Joseph with much less fanfare than the patron saint of Ireland, but with just as much reverence. And earlier this month, we sent our cameras to a Theology on Tap event where men were called to tap into their masculine spirituality using St. Joseph as their model. Tonight we're going to have Father Chris O'Connor. He's going to talk about St. Joseph and masculine spirituality. We need to redefine what we are as, uh, as men in our church, and we need to redefine what we are as men in our society. And I think Father Chris O'Connor will give us a good talk on how we are to be good Catholic men in our society and in our church. Mary tells him, Joseph, I need to tell you something. I'm pregnant. Don't worry, it's not by another man. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Trust me on this one. I use St. Joseph, who is the foster father of Jesus, as a model for a man to follow. And it means to be truly manly and to be holy. His courage was evident by his uh, protecting the Holy Family, uh, traveling with Mary to Bethlehem. And he just showed his continued love and even accepted Mary, knowing that she was not carrying his child, knowing that people would talk, people would mock him, but he stood by her and protected her. So I see St. Joe as being truly a great model for all men. How many of you are excited about eight hours worth of meetings? How many of you are excited about eight hours of paperwork? If you are, I got a few therapists and can help you give you their cards too to go see them. Okay? The men really need adventure. And when men are not allowed to have adventure, when men are not allowed to be dangerous, their hearts die and their souls die, and they're not real men anymore. Men don't like to sit around and just talk. Men like to do things. Men like to be active. And there's different ways of doing that with spirituality, I think, that we need to do. And I think uh, sometimes the way priests preach or something like that, we don't challenge men enough to embrace that. And I think if men don't hear that, they get turned off. Joseph never gave up on his marriage. Joseph never gave up on his foster son. He never gave up. And he was able to do that because he was a man of love, a man of courage, and a man of prayer. If you want to be a true man, you need to have those same characteristics. You have to be a man of love, to be a man of courage, to be a man of prayer. What really it meant to me, what Father said was, you know, have that courage that St. Joseph had and to be able to step forward and, and be our own men, be leaders of our family. I think it was interesting how Father mentioned that um, men should look for adventure. They should look for uh, a beauty to save, you know. I think... These days men are scared of that and they think that women are going to shy away, but we gravitate towards that. What I would like them to do is take away first, St. Joe is the model of what it truly means to be a man, but also to realize that um, men should be allowed to be men. They shouldn't be kept in a box, they shouldn't be emasculated, they should be allowed to be who God created them to be. It doesn't mean you go out and hurt people, but it means that men need to live out uh, their masculinity. They need to be as God created them, and we all need to have a battle to fight, and eventually to live in a beauty to rescue. There you go. Even when it comes to your spiritual life, embrace your adventurous side, guys. Well, that is it for this edition of Currents. Make sure and join us tomorrow night as we answer the ever-burning question, who's got game on the basketball court, Brooklyn or Queens? We'll find that out much more tomorrow night right here on Currents. But until then, be sure to check us out online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also find us on Twitter and on Facebook. Check us out all over the World Wide Web. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.